All right, I'm starting now. Okay, we're live. Yep. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is the March 9th, 2022 meeting of the Village of Maranek Planning Board. I'm going to take attendance for the minutes. We have uh, with us our members of the Planning Board, Richard Whitman, Ellen Styler, Sidney Goldstein, and Seamus O'Rourke, and myself. Um, we also have the building inspector, Frank Tavalacci, and Brittany O'Neill, our land use uh, board secretary. We have our land use attorney, Teresa, I don't know, I always want to say Bakner. Some people say Bakner, some people say Bakner, but you say Bakner, right? I say Bakner. You had it right. Bakner. <laughs> right the first time. John, uh, John Keller, our consulting engineer, Ashley Lay, and Jason, and it's Lai, Ashley Lai, and Jason Mentor from AKRF, our uh, uh, consulting planners, and Susan Oakley, our landscape architect consultant. Okay, that seems like the gang's all here. Um, before we get into tonight's agenda, I do have a couple of announcements. Um, oh, and I forgot to ask the planning board something when we were in the pre meeting. It wasn't a pre meeting, it was just waiting to go live. Um, first of all, an announcement, and I think uh, if we have some people here who are here to listen to Van Rand's place, you'll be interested in this announcement. The applicant for 715 Mamaronic Avenue has withdrawn their application and decided not to pursue the project. So that one is uh, off uh, everybody's list. Um, and planning board members, did you see the email about the screen for the courtroom? I have to comment back to um, the villages. Anybody have any comments on um, the, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, the governor's executive order uh, to expand op the open meetings law to the virtual meetings expires the middle of this month. Our next meeting will probably be a hybrid meeting with some of us in person in the courtroom with digital applications and no digital way to read them. So the, uh, the village is um, installing screens and uh, uh, making some changes to the electronics in the courtroom. So nobody has any comments, I'll answer um, the clerk treasurer's office back and tell them we're good to go on that one. Okay. Okay, I did attendance, I did the announcements, and now uh, brings us to the first real item on the agenda, which is uh, approval of the minutes from January 26, 2022. Does anybody have any comments on this? I, I have two small comments. Go for it. <laughs> um, one is hardly matters. There's a typo on page two. Uh, instead of shared and overlay, it's shared tan overlay. Uh, the only substantive comment that I had is <clears throat> I, I would like to note in the Beth Evans section um, that uh, Ms. Evans confirmed that although the wetland was staked in 2010, it was revisited in 2019 for no changes. And that was all I had. Okay. And the, uh, the typo is in which section on page two? Right at the... Towards the top of page two, it's yeah, shared tan overlay instead of shared N overlay. It hardly matters. Yeah, 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 I see it, yeah. Okay. It's uh, right under um, the subsection of uh, Jacqueline T Tyler. Um, it's the first sentence under that. Um, anybody else have any other comments? Okay, then I have a, can I have a motion to approve the minutes as uh, amended? So moved. Second. Second. I'll second. Okay, um, Ellen. Let's vote on it, Ellen. Yes. Cindy? Yes. Seamus? Yes. Richard? Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. That brings us to um, the first item on the agenda, which is a continued site plan review of 572 Van Rance Place. Um, I know there's been some question of why this is still being um, scheduled as a site plan review. We don't have a complete uh, application as yet. The applicant has been notified that they're uh, missing a landscape plan. Um, and we're also uh, still in the midst of our um, secret um, review uh, 
at the last meeting, I guess we declared ourselves to be lead agency. And um, this is the first time the uh, applicant is back to us before that, uh, we declared our intent to be a lead agency. So we have to um, declare the lead agency and continue with our secret, uh, with our secret. Um, which is, uh, Ashley, I guess the best way for us to do this would be to have the applicant present to us the changes that they've made in their um, plan since, uh, yes, I see everybody from APRF shaking their heads in person. <laughs> okay, so um, Brittany, if, promote Kristen. Um, if you could uh, promote the AKRF, I mean the um, Van Rans Place team, it's been a long day. <laughs> um, and uh, present to us the uh, changes that you've made since the last meeting on this. And Kristen. Uh, Hi. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the planning board. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Okay. Good to see you all again. Happy New Year. I haven't seen you yes. so long. <laughs> it's March. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. It's been a few months. <laughs> Uh, so Kristen Motel, uh, for the record, from Cuddy and Fader, on behalf of the applicants, 572 Van Rand LLC. Uh, we do have our whole team here tonight available to answer questions. That includes John Sullivan from Sullivan Architecture, um, as well as Jerry Ryan and Brandon Ahern, who are representing the applicants. We have Michael Stein from Hudson Engineering. Uh, and Dan Connors from Eris Energy Solutions, who can explain um, some of the resiliency features that we're proposing going forward. And as you know, we, we last appeared um, for a presentation in September, and we were uh, we, we did have an informal appearance before Harbor Coastal in November just to get some comments. Um, and I I would like to just do a do a summary as you had requested earlier because I think. Um, aside from just a reintroduction to refresh everyone's recollection here, there have been some pretty uh, significant modifications made to the proposal to address comments that we heard from the planning board and that we heard from Harbor Coastal um, over, over the last few months. So um, without further ado, I'll provide a, a brief presentation and I'm gonna also turn it over to John Sullivan when I'm finished, just to walk you through the plans briefly. Um, so the applicants, as you're aware, are proposing to replace uh, the existing residential structure on the property, and they would like to construct a, a sustainable five-story multifamily residential building. Uh, that building is proposed to have 10 units, six one-bedrooms and four two-bedrooms, and parking will be provided within a garage um, on the ground floor of the building. So the premise is, uh, is currently uh, zoned as RM3, which is a, a multifamily district and multifamily uses are a principal use. Uh, so there is no special permit that's required for this proposal. Um, and as everyone is aware, the project is within the flood zone. It's the AE flood zone with a base flood elevation of 25.8. Uh, as you are also aware, the existing structure on the property uh, does not comply with the Village of Mamaroneck floodplain development code and FEMA requirements for residential structures in the flood zone. Uh, also notably, there is no existing stormwater management infrastructure on the property. Uh, so the, the proposed building is going to be a significant improvement over existing conditions. The building will be raised above the base flood elevation, and I'll have John touch on that in a little bit more detail. Um, we are proposing to also increase the flood volume storage on site um, compared to existing conditions. And aside from obviously fully complying with the village floodplain development requirements and the FEMA requirements, um, the applicant is actually going to exceed those standards in several ways. Um, so the, the first way is that the, the building, when I say it's sustainable, it's actually going to be self-powering. So it can provide power to the residents during a complete village power outage. And the idea behind that, um, aside from, from the sustainability feature, of course, is to keep occupants safe without a need for them to immediately evacuate an emergency situation. So not only does that protect residents of the building, it also reduces the demand on emergency responders during a significant flood event. Um, and we, 
Dan Connors can touch on this a little bit more when I'm finished, but um, in short, the building will be powered by a rooftop fuel cell system, which is powered off of natural gas infrastructure that uh, has an undergrounding supply connection. So when I say it will be, um, for the most part, uninterrupted during significant events, that is why. Uh, the, the building is also going to be designed with safe evacuation measures to aid emergency responders. So um, we, we heard Harbor Coastal loud and clear and the members of the public, the planning board, we have redesigned the project to add an emergency door in the stairwell at elevation 33 above the base flood elevation to enable emergency egress in the event that there is a significant flooding event that door leads out to an, uh, a platform, an eight foot wide roof area um, that will serve as a queuing area in the event that residents need to be rescued uh, by lifeboats during a, a significant event. That eight foot wide roof area will also serve as a covered entry to the lobby. Uh, so it's, it's going to look seamlessly uh, from the architecture of the building, but it does serve a very important function. The building is also being designed to safely withstand flooding events and be resilient. So a lot of comments we received from the Harbor Coastal Commission uh, had concerns about repeat damage to a building due to flooding. Uh, the electrical, the mechanical, and all the lighting features will be located in the ceiling level um, above base flood at, uh, on the first floor at an elevation of 31 to prevent any damage. Uh, the parking will also be fully enclosed to prevent uh, vehicles from any remaining vehicles, um, which obviously the applicant is going to take measures to ensure as many vehicles as possible are not on the property during a flood event. Um, but any vehicles that remain will be contained on site because the parking area will be fully enclosed. The building has flood vents to increase the total volume storage of the site and also provide for additional flooding relief. Uh, elevators are proposed to be parked at the second and third floors for safety and to avoid repeat damage. Um, the lobby and all of the features at grade will also be constructed with flood resilient materials. So we're minimizing the need for repairs. Um, as I had mentioned before, there's no stormwater infrastructure on site um, and we're proposing a situation that will not increase stormwater runoff uh, we're going to also reduce the building footprint from what currently exists and the stormwater management infrastructure will reduce uh, downstream erosion potential as well. Um, of course, there's also some green features proposed here, such as the rooftop solar installation, um, electric vehicle charging stations for the residents, as well as the state of the art fuel cell system that I had mentioned. Um, and with that, actually, um, John, I think it would be a good time to turn it over to you to walk through the plans and, and show these design measures just in a little bit more detail. Please hear. Great. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? See me, I assume? Great. Uh, hello again. Um, I know it's been a few months since we, uh, we met previously. And Madam Chair and board members, if you'd like, as Kristen said, I'd be more than happy to go through the design of this. I know we discussed it at a previous meeting, which hard for me to believe that was in October, like five months ago already. But in any event, here we are. And um, Kristen touched on a couple of the adjustments that have been made since the last time that we met with all of you. Um, and they mainly had to do with comments that uh, this board made, as well as she said, as, as the Harbor Coastal Commission addressed with us. And we're all keenly in tune to uh, the flood issues that exist in this area and how best to address them. And, you know, here we have a building, that proposal that is on a re very small site, 6,500 square feet. So right off the get-go, we all know that that is about a thousand square feet less than what the minimum permitted site area is. It's a given, um, as well as the site width, 65 feet, 75 feet is the minimum lot width. So here we have like a small little postage stamp almost, if you would, of a parcel 
that's adjacent to an existing building that is somewhat in scale with what we're proposing to do. So those two issues, you know, create somewhat of, of a challenge for us. But we believe that what we're trying to suggest here is to add an improvement to the street corridor. And absent from the building that exists there today, which for all intents and purposes is a small little residential structure. And uh, maybe what we could do is my associate, Greg Dallop, I think, I, I, I think that um, he's on here. Is he not? Um, if, no. if he's not, can you guys uh, yeah, yeah. ask him or include him on what we're doing? Because Greg, 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 my yeah. associate, will, will bring up our slides and be easier to see as, as we walk uh, through this. So we need to have screen sharing with, uh, with Greg. I can get, you I can get access to screen share. I see Greg's name there. Yes, you have access. Great. Thank you, Brittany. No problem. So Greg, if you if you're on there, can you you know log in and bring up our slides? Great. Okay, terrific. So as you can see here, here's a here's a, a drawing that's a composition of what we're speaking about. Obviously, in the center, the colored portion of this plan is a site plan. It shows the parameters of the site and it indicates through a sort of terracotta color the portions of the building that are just that, a building on grade. Clearly, as you can see, there are no dwelling units proposed to be at grade, which is approximately at elevation 21. Obviously, it varies a little bit as, as the site slightly slopes. But what we're proposing here is nothing more than an entry structure that brings you up to the second, third, fourth, and fifth floors of this building. Um, you can see that the parking lot has on grade 12 spaces. I saw a memo somewhere about a parking structure. There's not a proposed parking structure here. These spaces are on grade. And you can even see from the coloration here that really none of them are completely even covered by the building. They're partially covered. Um, a few of them, but the ones toward the rear are not even covered parking spaces. Um, this section of the site that's white, in, in addition to the terracotta color, is, is actually the structure of the building above. And we have added one thing since the last thing that you saw here regarding parking, and that's the two rear parking spaces all the way to the back of the site that we're proposing to put a lift in, an on-grade lift. Probably something similar to maybe what some of you have seen in Manhattan, for example. If you go into Manhattan and you see these parking lots that have like a little lift on it, these are like nothing more than a two tier parking lift. We pick up two additional parking spaces. Clearly, these spaces are assigned. You rent an apartment in this building, you'll be assigned a parking space. And depending upon your vehicle, these two spaces back here may very well work perfectly fine if you have a, a Mini Cooper or VW Bug or maybe some classic Triumph um, or a smaller car today. If you have two, if you have two Escalades, eh, that might be a little bit challenged. You don't get then a lift spot. But the point is, is that we can accommodate spaces on site for 14 people rather easily. Now, back to our point here about the site. You can see the front of the property um, that, you know, we've, we've illustratively have drawn some landscape material here. Clearly, um, we have not submitted a proper landscape plan, as was alluded to. Clearly, one will be submitted at, at a time. But we're showing you that there's, there's, there's a minimal amount of landscape material on the site. Today, there's not a single tree or a plant on this site. There are weeds along the back of the property line. That's it. It has a building, it has a gravel area and a lawn area in the back. So the street trees that we show will be new. Um, any landscaping that's on the site clearly is new. Um, very much the, uh, the entrance to this building along this little eight foot strip along the left side of the site plan as you see is a private internal courtyard. Originally it was all open, but as Kristen just alluded to a moment ago, a portion of it now will be covered. And it'll be covered 
by a flat roof area that is actually serving as the potential rescue platform for the residents on the second floor. All where Greg is pointing to right now, you can see where we installed a door in the stairwell, um, which is right here, that goes out onto that platform, which then will allow a person or persons to walk to the front of the building. And if they needed to be or wanted to be rescued, they could be. We kind of came upon this through conversation with this board as well as the Harbor Coastal Commission. And we believe that we've been able to at least address this potential emergency egress during a flood. As Kristen alluded to a moment ago, remember that the second floor, which is the first floor of any residential use here, is 12 feet above grade, which is well above the flood areas here. So honestly, all of the units in this building are above any flood elevation. Good Lord, if we ever had another storm that got up that high, well, then maybe someone on the second floor might get a little water in their place. I mean, ho hopefully that doesn't happen, right? But we at least are, have a level of comfort to know that this building is at least elevated enough to protect the residents that live there. There are no mechanical rooms. There is not a cellar in this building. There are no mechanicals. Any of the mechanical entrance infrastructure that en enters this building electrically mainly, because this will be an electrical building, go up to the roof. And we can have a conversation and Dan will describe later, and I know we touched on this previously with all of you, that this company, DGB here, is, is into some an amazing, amazing, excellent environmental systems that are new to the, system, new to the world and that uh, can be accommodated through fuel cells as well as solar panels. You can see them up on our upper roof over here in the lower right-hand corner. So there are a lot of real interesting environmental um, you know, introductions that we're making here for potentially for this building and the residents that will live here, which are 10 units, three on a floor and one unit on the top floor. Um, there is an open space roof area up here. Um, I agree with the... Uh, comments that I saw that it probably really doesn't qualify as the quote open space. For the number of units that we have in this building, a quarter of this entire site would have to be designated as open space. Clearly that's probably not, at least in my opinion, not really necessary on a small urban little infill site, which is really what this is. And more importantly, as you all know, this is directly across the street from a park. So while we're providing some outdoor sitting area, recreation area for the tenants of this building. Yeah, it probably doesn't meet the total requirement of the village's you know, requirements for open space. We think that this plan and proposal has some real strong, nice merits, both environmentally speaking, as Kristen even alluded to, think about it. Today, you have a building on this site that gets flooded out all the time. There was no accommodations on the site whatsoever for stormwater retention. We're putting in a system here that will retain some water. We're putting in a building that elevates all the residents well above any floodplain elevation. We're building a structure that is highly sustainable. And, they make, and we're gonna improve the street corridor consistent with what exists here today, at least on one side of the building. Greg, bring up the next slide, please. These are the elevations of our building. The upper left is the front elevation. The horizontal lines you can see on the bottom here is, a, is, a, is an overhead door grate, if you would, that gives the, the uh, privacy and security for the parking on site. And you can see the four levels of residential units above. To the extreme left, you can see above the entrance gate, a, a railing and that's simply there for the protection of potentially those who may need to be out on that, on that little roof covering here to get out of the building in case of an emergency. The other elevations are somewhat self-understandable. The one on the right um, shows, if you can faintly see, Greg, if you could point with the cursor to where that exit door is, that emergency exit door, it's right there, out onto that roof that then goes across. The doors you see on the bottom are the entrance to the lobby for the building. 
So these elevations are somewhat consistent with what you see again adjacent to this. Let's look at the next, Greg. Next slide, these are existing photographs. You can see the building that exists there today. There's a house. It has, I believe, two apartments in it. Uh, I, I may be wrong on that, by the way. I mean, our, our clients, I'm not quite sure, but they're, they're rental units in the building today. You're correct, you can, John. You, you can see that's pretty barren. There's not a lot going on here. And I'm from both of these. And the reason why we took these ones is because the next two slides, which we took photographs and superimposed um, our rendering into a streetscape, Greg, there's the same views from the bottom and the top. We tried, obviously, not to mimic. <laughs> um, I wouldn't do that to the building next to it, but the scale of the building is consistent, the same height. The same concept of a, of a plinth uh, with a building sitting above it with four stories. And thankfully, we've been able to address the safety, particularly regarding floodplains of this. Um, and, you know, listen, we, we can put the street trees here that you see on the front of this building. Again, we only have 65 feet of width with, with a driveway intersection, so we can at least accommodate two street trees here, um, as well as some vegetation along the very back edges of the property. But it's, um, it's really an infill site and, and consistent with what exists there. And I like to believe that it's a highly sustainable building that we're gonna propose and an improvement to the streetscape and the street corridor. Clearly we will get to do a landscape plan. It wasn't one proposed yet. As you all can see that we have some variances that we need to request here in part because of the, in, the, the size of the lot to begin with the width of the lot. Um, I'll point out that we, we do need a side yard setback. Originally, we didn't. If you look at our previous submission to you, you'll see that we, we didn't need a side yard setback. We, we now, because we provided this little roof um, extension and that emergency access, yeah, I, I guess that covered portion of that, of that, of that area way that's the entrance there is a portion of the building. But the reality is, is that the building is set back at the right dimension. I would think that that type of accommodation would be viewed upon favorably and that type of variance would be looked at favorably. Um, the others, we can, we can discuss and go through this. But as I said, I, I think that there's some merit to this as a general overall streetscape improvement. We're gonna provide a mere 10 units, 20% um, of them certainly be um, affordable to meet your requirements for that. And, and, and the introduction of uh, potentially a, a model building that addresses some strong sustainability and energy use. Guess what? I don't care about, I don't care that Con Ed has a, uh, a moratorium on gas. I don't need it right now. I'm gonna look past that. So in any event, um, this is where we are with this. You know, we hope that the village will look at us with some, you know, some, some understanding and acceptability. Kristen, I mean, maybe we want to have um, Dan. Uh, is, is Dan, are you here with us? Of course, Greg, if you want to bring up the next slide. Um, it just wants to speak a little bit about, about what I was speaking about, about the, uh, about the fuel cells and how that process works. Yeah, Dan, yes. do you want to just say a few a few things about how uh, the, the fuel cells will work? Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to do that. And I promise I will be brief. Um, so there's only two exhibits that I have to show tonight, uh, aside from being available to, to field questions as they may arise. The first is a, our cover sheet, if you will, to this uh, story. And it, it, what it basically says are the, the three things that I think uh, Kristen and, and John had mentioned earlier, that the, uh, the building is going to be self-sustaining from an energy standpoint. That is that its, its energy uh, capabilities are designed so that um, over the course of a year, the, the kilowatt hours that we can self-generate by way of the fuel cells and the solar system are sized to be equal to the anticipated uh, energy consumption of the occupants and 
four EV charging stations as well. And that's quite significant because that all, those EV charging stations almost double the consumption. So it really, the, the, the building is going to power the building and some EV charging, which is quite substantial. Uh, secondly, it is designed so it will be resilient and, and it's really an always on. So the grid goes down and the fuel cells are designed so that they will, uh, they may take a little recover for a few moments, but they'll be back online uh, almost instantaneous, instantaneously. Uh, and we're actually, we're working with that right now to, to minimize the hiccup, uh, if you will, in the transition. The third thing is that um, this will substantially decarbonize from the, the typical uh, uh, energy uh, arrangement. If you could just throw the next slide up, and I, I'm, I'm really, this may be difficult for the users to see, but that big blue bar on the left is what a typical building of this nature would consume and emit as uh, greenhouse gases over the period of a year. And the bar, that blue bar is now shrunk by 73%. That's the number. You may not be able to read it on this sheet, but there's a three quarters reduction. The solar in this case contributes some, that's the yellow portion on the top. That's nice. Um, there's not a whole lot of room for solar on this building. So the fuels are actually picking up the majority of the, the decarbonization, including um, the top part of that green section uh, is by way of the electricity. And then they also produce some byproduct heat, which further reduces the need for the natural gas. And when you include that free heat, if you will, um, there's another little bonus in the, um, in the carbon reduction. So uh, we believe this is gonna be our state of the art um, building. It's, it's uh, new, it's, it's, it's pioneering, but it's all backed up by very successful operation with these products in the field elsewhere. That's it, and thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Uh, so, so at this time, I, I think we would be happy to take any questions from the planning board. Um, all the changes that were made over the course of the last several months uh, really demonstrate a building that's resilient to flooding. And um, our intention is it can really positively impact uh, development within the flood zone and set a standard moving forward for um, what is resilient and, and what should be constructed in the future. Okay, thanks very much. Um, that was helpful um, to understand the changes that you've made. Um, okay, Ashley from AKRF, is there anything that you would like to add to their presentation based on your review of what we have so far? Um, so we, we did prepare a memo reviewing the revised application. Um, we did identify a number of variances that are required uh, I did hear the applicant speak to those. Uh, the planning board just does not have the ability to waive the requirements for things like open space. So that would need to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And the, uh, the ideas or the, the thoughts that the architect was sharing can be presented to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, for those of you who are wondering uh, you know, what's going on from a uh, process point of view, the zoning board can't do their work until we make a secret determination. So that's what we're doing now. We're working on the secret determination. Um, tonight, we're going to declare ourselves lead agency. Um, we sent out all the notices and whatnot. Um, and then the applicant will go to zoning for the variance, uh, application for the variances. And as um, Ashley just mentioned, there were many. And then they'll come back to planning board for a site plan and um, a public hearing at that time. Um, so that's the process. And it's gonna take a little bit of time. And I know people are anxious to, to speak on this matter, um, but the things are, things are, as you can see, things are changing and um, we'll have the appropriate process and people will get an opportunity to speak on the matter when the time is right after uh, the variances are either granted or not granted which that'll change everything. <laughs> so, okay, we'll just keep moving. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Um, John Keller from Keller Sessions, do you have anything that you want to add to? I know you uh, gave us a, a somewhat uh, lengthy memo uh, commenting on, uh, on the revised plans. 
Uh, yes, I provided a memo. Uh, obviously, there's some very positive changes to the building um, as it relates to the floodplain issues. Um, one item I, I, I'm just not clear on, and maybe John can, can provide a little more detail on it, is the garage itself. Uh, I think Kristen mentioned that it's a, it's a totally enclosed garage, but it appears that it is still open on the sides and at the rear. And my concern is that we don't lose floodplain volume because we're creating a, an enclosed garage. Yeah, John, if I, if I could, thanks for asking that. You, you, you're correct. Maybe we should not use the reference to a garage um, because it is not enclosed. Um, yes, um, if we can, you know what? Hey, Greg, can I ask you to put the site plan back up or maybe I could just walk around it and, and a little easier to, to explain. Um, obviously, there's a footprint of a building on the site. I guess we need to do a screen share again. Uh, Brittany, do we need to do that? Oh, there we go. Okay. So, great. Thanks, Greg. Just zoom in a little bit there. So, as you guys can see, the, um, the property is a rectangle. And what we're proposing to do is that along the right side, which today, the right side, I guess this is, what direction is that? I don't even know. I think that's probably the Northeast side, but that's up against an existing wall of the parking structure of the building to our right. So that wall stays there. Across the back, we're simply proposing to put a fence. Not a solid fence. Frankly, hadn't thought about what the fence is really, but maybe a six foot high fence that just gives some, some security to the, to the site. That fence would then continue down the left side property to a point where you see a solid line. That then becomes a solid wall, probably a concrete wall that's stuccoed or some sort of finish on it. And that's only because I want to create this eight foot wide, almost like like almost very European type of alley landscape entry area that's private to the residents. The terracotta color is the footprint of the building. The sort of tan color that you see on the site is the portion of the site that's completely exposed to the sky. The little black sort of squares you guys see on the plan are columns, structural columns supporting the floor above. Hence, that when you enter the site through a gate, that would be water could go through. It's not a solid garage door. It's just a security gate that it goes up to provide just that security for the cars on site. But there are, you can see the parking spaces designated on the site. And as I said earlier, only a portion of the, like roughly half, call it that, of the parking spaces on the right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one where the handicap spot is, a portion of those spaces are covered by the building. The other portion is exposed to the air. So the site, while it's secure in terms of a fence or a wall or an existing wall on the adjacent building is really open, only covered by the footprint of the upper portion of the building. Yeah, okay, it's John. Off so we, a garage. And so it's, it's on grade parking. So we have the rear of the site and a portion of the side that's open so that floodwaters can still flood that garage area. Correct. Water, which is, water, which, it, is it, which is fine. It, we just don't want to lose that floodplain volume. And that I wasn't right, I, sure of but, whether it was completely enclosed or not. Right. Which is why, John, somewhere I believe we did a calculation that, again, the footprint of our building, the terracotta area there. And, and I know we show it as a little terracotta area in the front there. It's really just nothing more than, 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 a, than a block wall in the uh, trash enclosure. Um, that right. footprint is less footprint than the house that's there today. Correct. So yes. you're right. Any floodwaters yeah. would easily enter that uh, the garage door, great if you would, flood the site. If someone's car was in here, it's going to be flooded. One plus for this is though, <laughs> a car is not going to float off site. It'll stay contained in the property. 
Thanks, John. I, don't, I, I don't know if that's a benefit for that for that potential auto owner, but whatever. Okay, and Michael and Michael uh, indicated that the flood plane volume would actually increase slightly. And in our memo, we asked uh, if Mike can share those calculations with us so you yes, can correct. verify it. And my apologies, I, I thought that had been included, so uh, we can definitely include that in the next submission. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, clearly, um, the street trees, any vegetation on the roof, any vegetation in the alley, any vegetation along the back and the front will have to be indicated on a, a landscape plan. Um, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that you can basically do that after you come back from zoning, right? We don't need that. Do we need that before zoning? Before zoning? Nobody's saying. No, I think that can wait until they come back. Wait until you come back. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Just, and then, of course, there was a memo from the Westchester County, which I believe was shared with you, the Westchester County Planning Board um, by uh, county uh, section of the county general minister law. They review projects such as this. They had some comments with regards to some things they would like to see in the in the building. Um, we uh, this came a while ago, but you you all weren't here, so um, I think you probably uh, hopefully got it um, with regards to uh, you know um, plugins for e bikes and. Um, water management, affordable housing. But the affordable housing issue is going to probably be raised at zoning because you're asking for more units than the zoning code uh, allows. Um, so that's something that you will face down the road. Uh, any members of the planning board have any questions at all with regards to anything you've heard tonight or read? Um, can, can someone let us know <clears throat> during Hurricane Ida, what was the flood water depth at that site? Mike, can you answer that? But I kind of thought I heard you all offer to us once before that it was about it was about seven or eight feet above grade, which would be at elevation 20, 28 or 29. Yeah, John, that, that's consistent with uh, my discussions with the applicant based on um, the what, what happened to this existing structure on site. The full basement was flooded and a significant portion of the first floor as well. So that's consistent with what I've heard too. Okay, because while we're, we all hope and pray we're not going to have more flood events, that's not the truth. The, the truth is that the flood events are coming more frequently and more severely. And so, um, you know, I, it, it's good that we're, you know, you're, you're looking at this being uh, the habitable space being significantly above the base flood elevation, but it's, it's, it's not the reality of what's of the trend here. And clearly that site is going to flood in less than hundred year storms. I think it's gonna flood fairly regularly. So I am particularly interested in what Chief Costa has to say, not just about this building, but at some point, if we keep incrementally stuffing more people into, the, into a hazardous area, it's gonna reach more of a tipping point than what it is right now. You, you couldn't get a lifeboat out to any of the buildings. The buildings were surrounded by water. They had moats around them. You know, Pity the poor person who runs out of insulin or has a heart attack, Emergency responders just can't get there um, as, as hard as they try. So I'm really, I, I, I'm hoping we can get in touch with Chief Costa and, and ask about the incremental capacity that this would be adding to an already strained uh, first responders. And, and I do, as, as lovely as the building sounds in terms of green infrastructure and being self-sustaining and, and that is very important. I am very concerned about increasing capacity, adding more people, putting them in harm's way, putting the first responders in harm's way, and just cramming people into the floodplain. It just doesn't make any sense to me. But I'm, I have an open mind. I have a question about the parking because I think that's, that's somewhat intriguing that the two spaces on the lifts, 
I know our parking definition has to deal with, um, you have to be able to access the vehicles at all times. Um, and is that possible with, with the two cars on the lifts? And do, do you otherwise, uh, otherwise meet all the criteria and the requirements of the, the size of the spaces that is specifically set out in the code? Sizes of the spaces are addressed and they're correct. Those, there are only two lifts, right? They would be assigned to the same party that has the parking space below, if need be, obviously. So they would have control of the lift and how they would access their vehicle from above and bring it down and move their car out of the way, and et cetera. It's just a, it's just a means in which to get, um, you know, two more parking spaces on the site that are very achievable. It'd be very similar to doing tandem parking spaces where you have a, a car front and rear. Um, right. Same person who is going to be owning both vehicles, so they're they're going to be accessing, have the keys, pull one car out, then pull the second car out. Right. And, and, by, and by the way, uh, Ms. Goldstein, I, I did, uh, I, I spoke to Chief Costa, um, and uh, he and I spoke a bit. Um, I forwarded him these drawings, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago, I'm, I'm just trying to remember. Um, and I know he has someone who's gonna review them. He mentioned to me that he was gonna have a discussion with Frank, um, and, uh, but I, I haven't heard back from him. And uh, so I, I suspect that we'll have a, a discussion about all this and I'll, I'll, I'll show him what we're doing and how we've tried to address the emergency uh, you know, exit issue and uh, the height of the building, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, but he at least has them and I've spoken to him. So we'll, we'll hear back from him soon. That's great. If Frank, if you can kind of carry our concerns to that conversation that you, you have with Chief Costa, that would be terrific. Uh, this, this, I mean, obviously uh, emergency uh, egress and ability to evacuate people or ability to get to people are gonna be part of our secret review. So this is something that's timely. This is information that we're gonna need sooner rather than later. Yeah, it, and just a note on that too, there are three bedroom units on the property right now um, and an entire unit, a, a whole family had to be evacuated in mm -hmm. Hurricane Ida. Uh, so there's, it's not really like we're going from, uh, you know, two or three people living on site to a, to a substantial number more. It's really an incremental increase um, because there, there are, the capacity is a substantial number of people right now. Um, and the goal is to, to get them into a safe structure so that they do not need to continue being evacuated from the property. Good point. Okay. Um, about the uh, natural gas hookup, uh, because there is a moratorium that uh, Mr. Sullivan did mention and then said he wasn't too worried about it. Is there gas uh, hookup to the building now? Is that why you're not worried about hooking up to natural gas at the building now? I see Dan. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we don't need a gas um, connection oh. for the new building. I, I, honestly, Madam Chair, I, I, I don't know the building that's there today. And I honestly don't know that there is a gas connection. I, I would assume there is just by the type of structure that's there, but I don't know. Isn't natural, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say the write-up did say that the um, natural gas would be fueling the fuel cells. Yes. Um, right. So if there is no natural gas there already, and it's or if there isn't, it's not sufficient for your purposes, then that would mean a new hookup with Con Ed, and there's a moratorium now. But you think there's other ways you can fuel the fuel cells? Uh, let me uh, jump in very quickly. So uh, yes, indeed, the fuel cells run off of natural gas um, today. Uh, there, my recollection, there is actually an existing natural gas hookup today there. And the additional natural gas load, when you factor in the very high efficiency of these uh, units um, is, is compared to uh, today's consumption is actually uh, quite a bit lower per, per uh, occupant, certainly. There's one other environmental attribute, um, and that is, it, it is a little futuristic, admittedly, but we've all heard nowadays about green hydrogen. The fuel cell actually does run on hydrogen internally, and this particular fuel cell can handle 20 or 30 uh, percent hydrogen in the natural gas when such green hydrogen is widely available from our gas companies. 
So it's it's somewhat future proof in that respect, and that would be a further decarbonization as well. Can can I ask a follow up question on that topic? So you know, on your chart, um, I don't know what the grid was. I mean, New York has a renewable portfolio standard to get to fifty percent, I think, by twenty thirty or something. Um, and so I don't know what it's based on. I don't know if I really need that answer. But from an environmental and uh, safety perspective, we have, you, I assume you effectively have a power plant on a very small scale uh, on this site. It's gonna be converting natural gas to hydrogen and then converting that to electricity. So I, is there a permitting process for that? Is there you know, on-site pollution instead of pollution that's out at a power plant that ultimately will be more and more green as the grid progresses? Um, what about the risk of a fire? or of a leak, uh, is, this the, is this the type of installation that exists in very densely populated you know, residential neighborhoods? Just maybe a little okay. understanding of, of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to quickly answer in, in bullet form to not occupy so much time, but uh, there are currently over 2,500 of these units running successfully for more than a decade in Europe. Um, there's um, some we're now introducing into the US market but these are operating in people's homes and small businesses in Europe today and have done so for a decade or more. Um, and the economics are now making more sense where they, they run here. Yes, there is a permitting process. Um, it is somewhat akin to a, a gas appliance, um, except that we must have an interconnect with the utility. And we have done that successfully in Long Island um, as part of our the hybrid inverter, that's the magic box that uh, allows us to toggle off grid. Um, so yes, there is a fire safety review um, and that's been completed successfully, successfully in a town on Long Island in one of our early residential units so far. And th would this be the first installation in, of your knowledge in Marinick and maybe in Westchester County? Um, it depends when this goes forward. Um, it's possible, uh, but it's we're also looking at uh, several other sites, uh, some of the properties that the owners own uh, as well. And then what about um, on-site pollution versus, you know, a grid that sites power plants and is getting only more and more greener? I mean, what's yeah, the no, I, chemical you know, process? Uh, understood. So comparing what we have today, the carbon coefficient of the fuel cell is less than half of what the New York State average coefficient is. This jurisdiction of the electric utility has a higher than average uh, carbon coefficient, actually. And then when you when you lock in the value of the byproduct heat, which definitely this facility can use for domestic hot water heating, that that greenhouse gas emission uh, is even better. Furthermore, there's no NOx NOx and no SOx because it's not combustion. So it, it really is a strong environmental advantage over traditional uh, central power plants. Plus you don't have to distribute it and lose 10%. That's factored into the, the logic as well. And it's resilient. Okay, yeah, that, that, that all makes sense. And I, get, and I get that it's very efficient. Just final, very specific question. What is the byproduct? Like, is it gonna be like running a car all the time on the roof of the, this building on, you know, in the Marinick on site, right, right downtown? So the, the primary byproduct is CO2, uh, only half of what you would have if you did, if you, if you uh, use that same unit, the natural gas in our central power plant today. Okay, but, but yeah, okay. So it's a CO2 byproduct that's existing on site instead of off site at a power plant somewhere down the transmission line, right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And then, by the way, that will be diminished further when there's hydrogen in our pipelines. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, anybody else have any questions? I was going to ask, are there any noise decibels on that unit on the roof? Yeah, the unit is whisper quiet. Um, it, it, you know, the fuel cell itself has no moving parts except for a, a small fan. Um, it, you could touch the side cabinet of it and it feels a little warm to the touch, but that's all. And, um, you know, I could, I, the DB number is in our literature. It's probably something in the thirties, you know, it's, it's just about a whisper. Okay. 
Okay. Um, anybody else? No one else? All right. It seems like we have to try to get some information from the fire chief. Um, is there, and then we have a couple of open questions from the stormwater that in John's memo that would be helpful for us for our secret review. Um, any, does that help sum it up? Ashley, am I, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the next step is for the planning board to declare lead agency, and then the applicant can go back and um, provide responses to all the comments that re they received from the planning board and the planning board's consultants and make a submission. And then depending on, on how that, that falls out, you could potentially make your secret determination at the next meeting or, you know, the meeting after they make their submission. Ashley, just a quick question. You, you've reviewed the part one of the EAF. Is there any information that's still needed in connection with that? Um, I don't believe so. I'll double check, but I don't believe there was anything outstanding there. Okay. So we, so we need to declare ourselves lead agency for secret purposes. Um, so I need a motion and from someone to declare the planning board the lead agency for. I'll move. Second. Okay, let's uh, take a vote. Uh, Ellen. Yes. Seamus. Yes. Richard. Yes. Cindy. Yes. And I vote yes. All right, so that's done. Um, does the applicant have any questions for us? Um, we would request that a uh, public hearing be scheduled at this time so that we can make the required notifications and prepare the, the supplemental materials and submit them in a timely fashion, while also preparing the zoning board materials, of course, too. Uh, we, we did have a conversation about this, um, and um, we think that we were going to schedule a public hearing tonight, but given the fact that we need to make a secret determination before you go to zoning um, and the likelihood of you coming back from zoning within the secret timeframes uh, are probably pretty low, <laughs> um, that uh, we uh, decided, and I think it's the right decision to do the public hearing when you come back from zoning. So a secret determination will be made before before we appear before the Zoning Board of Appeals? Is that what? That's, and, the, that's the way it works. It has the, to be. It right, right. So we make a secret determination. Correct. So, so the next appearance that we have with this board will not be a public hearing. Um, but Correct. in terms of our us getting our materials in in a timely manner so we can make the next meeting agenda, um, I guess my question is, is that the first meeting in April? or what date should we be targeting to come back before if, this board? If you can get everything in to get here for the first meeting in April, mm -hmm. because okay. the, the, the deadline for the 23rd of March is already gone. Right. right. There's no mailing required for you to come back to the right. board. So all you need to do to come back is update your sign. Mm -hmm. And you could just use duct tape and a Sharpie. Yeah. Right. Right, you okay. don't have to have a whole new sign printed, right? Sure, yeah, we just want to make sure we, we get the materials in timely. Right. So, right. okay, and, we'll, uh, we'll target that meeting. Thank you. Right, and, and, and then, uh, and then um, depending on uh, our determination of significance, then, you know, you'll either have to work through some of that, or uh, if it's a neg deck, you go on to um, go on to zoning for the variance review which, you know, they only meet once a month, so that will take some time. Um, and then you'll come back to us for the full site plan review, at which point you'll need all the landscaping material and anything that changed while you're at zoning resubmitted to us. Okay. Right. Right. I, I guess the only thing I'd like to say, Kristen, is make sure we have everything that you would want us to have to make a secret determination, okay? That's a good point. Good. Right. Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> Quickly give us all the information we need. <laughs> right. Copy that. Okay. All right, good. Okay. Um, I think that wraps up uh, 572 Van Rans for today. And by the way, uh, Ms. Chairman, uh, just thank you very much for letting me know that 715 was, was withdrawn. That's the first I heard about it, so. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I, well, they did it last week, and we heard about. I heard about it last night through the grapevine, and but it was confirmed today, so I could announce it today because I I know there's people watching this that were concerned about it. Um, but and, and Michael, we've missed you. We really. Have. <laughs> well, that that's my that's yes. one of my applications to find out. <laughs> that was, I was hearing it. There's another one in your application. <laughs> I thought was that they had purchased that property, right? Was that that under? No, I, I don't believe so. I think they were contracts. Uh, yeah, the the um the somebody notified us that they they decided not to pursue the project. So I guess it's still for sale. The building is still for sale then. But, so thank you. Have a great evening. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Very coherent presentation. <laughs> okay. That brings us to the next item on the agenda, which is a new application. Um, this is the first time they're here before us um, for 1037 Oaks Lane. Uh, the applicant proposes to install an in ground pool. So uh, we can um, promote the uh, spokesperson for, uh, we don't take comment, we're not taking comments. Uh, and in fact, uh, can you turn the chat off, Brittany? The chat should be off. We can't use the chat during a public meeting for open meeting law purposes because they're, uh, they're not recorded. So we can't use chat. Um, it, you gotta remember to turn it off. Well, well next time we'll be in person. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Um, can you get rid of the chat on the screen? Okay, we have, we have someone for uh, 1037 Oaks. Yep, I'm here. It's just my video is not working for some reason. Oh, so. Uh, so my name is Angela. I'm from Dan Sherman Landscape Architects, representing our clients at 1037 Oaks Lane. We are proposing an in-ground swimming pool in the rear yard. Uh, they have an existing stone patio right now. We're just proposing the pool right off the existing patio. The site has evergreen screening. Uh, all do you have uh, plans you want to share your screen? Yeah, I have a plan. I can share my screen. Okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. Okay. So we have an existing patio right now in the rear yard, and we're proposing the swimming pool right off the existing stone patio. It's a standard 20 by 40 in-ground swimming pool with a spot on the interior of the pool. Uh, we're just proposing a little bit of new patio on both sides so you can easily enter the spot in the shallow end. The property already has existing evergreen screening along the both side yards and the rear yard. We are proposing a four foot high pool compliant fence along this side of the property and then around this and then a chain link four foot high fence along the side yard. The rear of the property has a six foot high concrete existing stone wall that we'd like to use as part of our pool enclosure. And then we're proposing a chain link fence along the right side property and an aluminum picket pool code fence to attach to the house as part of the enclosure. Um, in terms of stormwater, unfortunately, our engineer couldn't be here, but he plans on taking in the water with drain inlets within the lawn and then piping them to an in-ground Coltec system. And then we're proposing an underground propane tank to uh, atta uh, attach to our pool filter for the heater. The pool filter is located in the rear of the property and it meets all required setbacks and screening. Um, the existing trees here have a lot of existing evergreen shrubs underneath them. Uh, so the pool filter will also be screened from any uh, neighboring properties. And that's really the extent of it. Okay. Uh, pretty straightforward. Um, KRF, uh, Ashley, you did. Uh, a memo for us that went through uh, the pool code chapter 300 um, and a couple of other things. There's uh, some comments on some um, additions to the uh, some of the uh, sheets in the in the, in the uh, submission. Do you want to comment on this at all? Yes, I would say overall our comments were pretty minor. Um, we just needed to verify that some of the things like the filter were within were outside of the setback. Um, we needed to see a calculation, I believe, of the development coverage within the rear yard. 
and just con confirmation on whether or not any lighting is proposed. Um, but the proposed project is a type two action under seeker and we recommend that the board classify it as such this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, and there were uh, some comments also from the consulting engineer with regards to um, the stormwater management and some of the other issues. John, do you want to um, just highlight some of the comments? I'm assuming, um, Ms. Laffey, you received the copies of the memos? Yes, I have all three copies. I've reviewed them with our engineer as well, and we plan on addressing mm -hmm. them for our submission to the building and engineer department. Okay. okay. The, the design was uh, was well prepared. Uh, my comments are minor in nature. And most of them are addressing notes and requirements that have to be within the SWIP. Uh, and if our comments are addressed, I find that the design is satisfactory and meets the conditions of the stormwater regs. Okay, so it sounds like we just have some minor comments, things we need to clean up. Uh, you also have a, um, a memo from the landscape architect. Susan, do you, is there anything that you want to comment on? It's uh, the, uh, the memo is pretty straightforward. Is there anything you want to add or highlight? Yes, I, I think that um, it's important to include the landscaping that's at the front of the property due to the construction entrance and um, tree protection uh, being uh, noted on the plans. And there are a number of trees in the in the front of the property that aren't shown on the landscape plan. They are on the survey, but uh, it's important that all the information be in one place. Are you, are you planning on removing any trees to construct the pool or is it open lawn now? No, we are not removing any trees right now. It's an open flat lawn. So we will include all trees and shrubbery that are in the front yard and we'll show any required tree protection as well. Okay. All right, that's pretty straightforward then as far as uh, what we need and what you need to do. Do you have any questions for us? No, I think I'm good. Is, are there any more questions for me? Okay, well, um, if you wanna take the plan down, I'll see if any members of the planning board have any questions for you. Anybody have any questions on this? This is pretty straightforward. Doesn't look like it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so tonight we need to type this for CEQA um, because it uh, meets the uh, conditions as a private house for uh, type two action. We need a motion to type this as a type two action. So moved. Second. You two are quite the team tonight. <laughs> okay. Kind of like a rhythm. <laughs> right. Okay. Let's vote. Let's mix it up. I'll start with somebody else now. Um, <laughs> Davis. Yes. Ellen. Yes. Uh, it depends on where you all are on my screen. Yes. <laughs> Cindy. Yes. Uh, Richard. Yes. And I vote yes. Okay. Uh, you have your homework assignment. <laughs> And um, as with the previous applicant, the sooner you get it back to us, the sooner we can um, finish this up and move you on to uh, your permitting process with the building inspector. Okay, very good. So we, re we revise our plans and then we have to come back to the next meeting. Is that how it works? Um, uh, if you can get them into us, Brittany, if they were to quickly revise their plans, when would they have to get them in if they want, it, could we like, get them in on the 23rd or would they have to shoot for the 6th of April? No, it would have to be this. I mean, today was the cutoff. That would be up to you, but today was a submission for supplemental. So, okay. Okay. So we'll uh, for the next meeting and then be here for the April meeting. Yeah. The first meeting in April, which I think is April 6th, the first Wednesday in April, a second that Wednesday. Would Okay. Yeah, that would mean that those items are due March 23rd. Okay. Okay. He's got this down pat. <laughs> okay. All, All right. right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to the last minute addition to the agenda. Um, the planning board um, just needs to have a short discussion about um, what happened at um, 8 in. 886 and 888 Oriental Avenue after, the, after they left us. Um, Frank called me yesterday. Um, there was a meeting yesterday between the village and the applicants. 
with regards to moving forward. And Frankie asked um, for um, the planning board's opinion on something. So I'm going to turn this over to Frank. And um, uh, I didn't know anything about what was going on. So this was new news to me. But then when I called Teresa to tell her, it wasn't new news to her. So if Teresa wants to add anything, because she was involved in uh, the discussions in a limited way um, to bring us up to date with um, you all may remember that 886 was before us multiple times in the past couple of years, a subdivision and then an annexation and then another subdivision uh, and then um, a swimming pool application, um, which is the last thing that they were before us for. They took uh, 886, took the back of the 888 lot, um, and then they came to us for an application for a swimming pool and a new SWIP and a new site plan and whatnot. And then what happened, Frank? <laughs> so just to recap historically, this board uh, approved the site plan for the swimming pool uh, construction. And um, they started with the uh, construction, the reconstruction of the accessory structure, which was the pool house. And they still have a valid building permit for the pool house and they are working on that now. Uh, what happened was the contractor kind of overstepped their, the approval that they had for the site plan, and they were supposed to only enter the site from the 886 parcel. And at one point, they were entering from the 888 parcel. Um, so the Sigalos... Uh, uh, actually own both parcels, one uh, personally in their own names, and that's the 886 parcel, and they also own the 888 parcel and an LLC. Um, so they are the parents of starting this pool now, and they felt that, um, you know, yes, the contractor did uh, overstep his approval, but they've... Uh, uh, put the entrance the way it was supposed to be, the way the site plan was approved across the 886 at the front of that house, and they haven't uh, impacted that 88 parcel any further. Um, I did get information from their engineer about what they were planning. Uh, originally, they were talking about just using it as a construction entrance, um, and uh, he was going to uh, design stormwater for that construction entrance. That never happened. Um, they also brought some on to the 888 lot, which uh, I did get the information of the, you know, the amount of fill and, uh, you know, its origin and all that. So I did get what I asked for, but I still felt that uh, it's up to the planning board to make the decision whether I should uh, issue this uh, building permit for the pool only, which was the, which was the site plan, which is what you approved. Um, so they didn't follow the site plan that we had approved and they didn't follow it by uh, building a construction entrance through the 888 lot and bringing fill into 888 in order to do so. Is that, is that correct? Am I understanding this correctly? Uh, yes, basically, yeah. Okay, so so once somebody doesn't follow an approved site plan, they have to come back to the planning board for a revised site plan by code. Right. So so what they're what they're uh, suggesting is that, and what I had said to them is, is uh, if we were to issue this building permit for the pool now, uh, and we left that permit open. And we wouldn't close that out permit until you return to the planning board and address all the issues that the planning board may have with the, uh, the liberties that they took, which I'm calling liberties on the 88 parcel. So that, that's, what, that's what the meeting, that's how we ended the meeting. It was the other day, it was the day before yesterday, I believe, um, that they would return to the planning board uh, and they would address the planning board's uh, uh, questions and, and, and comments uh, and address everything, um, but they'd like to start their pool now. 
So, so if, I mean, the issuance of a permit really is, is your responsibility. Um, so, but if you were to issue a permit to allow them to begin construction of the pool, but quote, hold the permit open, does that mean they don't get a C of O and they can't use the pool until they come back or would they be using the pool all summer? Well, they wouldn't get a CO, a certificate of compliance for that pool, no. Whether they would use it or not, you know, that's a different- well, Let's get real. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the fill. So, I mean, yeah. If, yeah. if we remember the back of that site is very wet, I think there was a lot of conversation about the, you know, they, they said it would be a modest amount of fill. Obviously they need more fill. We well, don't know. There was more fill and, and after John's comments, they cut the, number, the amount of fill down, but now it seems like they brought in fill that wasn't part of the plan. Right, and so that's my concern is that the neighbors are gonna get flooded. And it's, I mean, that's, that's a serious consideration you know, you're not supposed to flood your neighbors with what you do. And I think it's sort of, I, I would hate to see them go go ahead, build the pool and then find out that they can't accommodate the stormwater changes. That, that wouldn't be a good result for anybody. So I would think they would need to come back for a planning board review of what now they really are doing and see if that passes muster. And then they can start construction. It would be a very expensive exercise to do it in reverse potentially, or we're just, you know, a paper tiger and a rubber stamp and why are we bothering? So, so in regards to the fill, so the, you had it proved, I think, a, a 240 yards or something, you know, a small amount of fill for the back of the property where that pool is. And I think they delivered that amount of fill to the back of the property. It's the front of the property that's the problem. But if you also recall that that property uh, originally a woman builder was going to build on it, she had a permit for a foundation. She installed a two foot high retaining wall uh, that really has protected the neighbor to the right of that. So although they brought fill in for that 888, I'm not sure that in itself would flood the neighbors. I, I think it's actually a better condition than it was there before. What was there before was a water basin that used to flood out all the time. Yeah, so but it wasn't, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Frank, go ahead. No, go ahead. It, it wasn't the neighbor on the saw on Orienta. It was the neighbor who's actually on Skibo that backs up to the property where I think the particularly large depression that would pond on a regular basis. So maybe the retaining wall helps the person on the right-hand side when you're facing the property, but I don't know based on the slope, I don't know which way that water would be going. They, well, to bring the fill into the back of that property where the pool house and the pool is gonna be, they built a retaining wall along that back wall also. And, and so I'm not sure that even the ski boat property would flood out at this point. And, and the back of the property, uh, I don't think has anything to do with the front. I'm more concerned with what in the front actually. I, I think we don't know enough, or we, I mean, certainly you may, but I don't think the planning board knows enough about, you know, where this water is going and where the fill's going and, and how it impacts everything. And, you know, it's kind of bad precedent to, you know, why do we, why do, we do site plans if people aren't going to follow them? And can I pop in here a second? So, mm -hmm. um, so Frank is asking the planning board for its recommendation essentially because Frank is the person that had that has the authority to make the decision whether to issue the uh, the permit to construct the pool or not um, under section 342-74 of the code it says that no building permit may be issued for any building within the purview of this article except in conformance with an approved site development plan and no certificate of occupancy may be issued for any building or use of land unless the building is constructed or used or the land is developed or used in conformity with an approved site development plan. So the, the code is pretty clear on this point that when you are required to come to the planning board to get a site development plan approved, that you're thereafter required to follow the site development plan that is approved. Because otherwise, as Cindy said, what are we doing here? 
And I think that when you look at the issue of stormwater grading and those types of issues, the question is really how, how has this change affected, um, affected the conclusions that Mr. Kellard previously reached with, request, with respect to stormwater. Now, if no site development plan is required, Frank still has John look at the stormwater and all those issues as part of the engineering function for the village. Um, but, you know, it's the planning board's decision informed by its experts that holds. You guys make you guys make the decision. You're not paper tigers. You make the decision, and the applicant in this case had the opportunity to to switch back to fix what they had done in order to just comply with the site plan. Okay, and so what you have here is you have a change particularly related to a construction entrance, which is a really important issue. John looks at those construction entrances. We all look at them to see, do they affect trees? Do they affect landscaping? Do they affect grading? Do they cause compaction that's gonna cause a stormwater problem? You know, all that stuff, if you will. So um, just, just so you know, um, you're free to, draw whatever, make whatever recommendation you want to to Frank. Uh, but I do believe that it is not inconsequential in terms of setting a precedent. And we can make a recommendation to Frank, but Frank basically is the decider. Yes, Frank is the decider. He's the building inspector. That is right. correct. Right, right. Well, they're going to have to come back to us at some point in time. It's the question of should they be coming before they start the construction of the pool or before they get full use of the pool uh, legally? I mean, I don't doubt that if that pool is there and it's a hot day and there's no CFO, that there are going to be people in the pool. <laughs> I, I think it's a question of compliance with the law. They, they have to come back before construction starts. It's Are we allowed simple. to take any comments from, there is the lawyer here for the owners of the property. No, okay. we don't need any Just comments from them. We know what they did. They owned up to it. They didn't follow the site plan. They didn't follow the code. I think they were actually cited and uh, a stop work order was given or something, right, Frank? I mean, they, they, I think they know what they did. Uh, it's a question, though, of how we proceed from here. We can't change the past. We can only go forward. Um, so, okay, so Richard and Cindy have made their, uh, how they feel clear. Um, Kathy, say, Kathy, can I just make a suggestion that you give the, give the attorney a chance to, to talk since we did put them on the agenda and they are here, you know, um, it doesn't mean it's going to affect the outcome, but just from a due process perspective, if he's here, I would, I would advise you to let him speak. All right. Well, before we do that, um, the uh, applicant, the the owners of the property, since it's legally under two separate names, um, made a big deal about us separating out the uh, addresses on the um, on the um, on the agenda, so that it's listed twice. Um, which is fine. I mean, the only time it was ever listed together is when we did the subdivision to break that uh, formally uh, one property into two properties. Um, and Kathy, I would just say about that, we're obviously using the two properties together as one, and that's what gave rise to the problem in the first place. So right. I see what point they were trying to make there. Right. Well, whatever. Um, but because now we're, something has been done to 888, is there anything that we need to do with the uh, driveway and the construction entrance and the, the improvement that was done on 888 without any kind of site plan review at all? Is there anything that this falls under? We would have to come back for the site plan changes on 
on both because the changes that they made on 888 were related to the work that was going on 886. So the fact that it's owned by a different party theoretically should be irrelevant. Right, right. Well, it's the same people. It's just a different legal construct. Okay. Was the owner willing to completely restore the disturbance on 888 to its original condition? I'm sure they would. They made the point that there was an existing driveway to that 888 parcel. It might have been a house there years ago. I'm not exactly sure. Oh, it was one property with a big house in the middle. Yeah, so, so, it, so there was a driveway that uh, was existing, um, but they went beyond that, you know. They went all the way back. Now they uh, only we elevate the attorney at this point in time, and maybe that person can answer these questions for us and maybe explain whatever it is that they want to explain to us. <laughs> okay, you're elevated. Uh, would you like to? Start your video so we can see you and your audio. Uh, Wick, person Wexstein. Hello. Yes, can, uh, can, is your video working? I'm trying, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Adam Wexstein from Hockerman Tortorella and Wexstein. Um, we do think that the distinction between these lots does make a difference. You approved the site plan for 886. We, the client did use 888 or the client's Contractor used 888 as access, which was a mistake. We are committed to complying with the site plan that you approved for 886. To the extent there's disturbance on 888 because it's over half an acre in area, we do need site plan approval for the work that's done there. And the commitment that was made to Frank and your town's attorney and the village manager at the meeting yesterday was that we would come in promptly with a site plan application for 888. I believe that they are legally separate lots. I believe the only one you approved the site plan for was 886. And I don't believe there is a basis to resort to those provisions of the code, which basically put things on hold when there's a violation as to a particular piece of property. They are owned separately by different entities. And again, they weren't both subject to your approval. And we're not asking to, to have free reign here. What we're asking is that we are able to go along with the methodology that was agreed to yesterday and get back to you, probably not this coming meeting, but the meeting after for a site plan for 888. There are no plans to improve it at this point with a building or any kind of structure. I will say that the driveway, if you look back on the various plans, including the subdivision that created the original lots, that driveway is there. Now, again, there was disturbance. There was a little fill on that lot. Um, that does require site plan on 888. So, so Mr. Mr. Wexstein, I, I just have to understand this. I, I understand that the, the, the difference in the legal title of the two lots, I, I do appreciate that. What I don't understand is that once you use 88, you wouldn't have used 888, but for the improvements being done on 886. So it, it kind of functionally has, has merged those lots because 888 would be in the same condition was 886 not being improved. So I, I you know, I, I appreciate your arguments, but I, I just don't, I, I have a hard time seeing them as totally separate when one was used for the other. And if it was in completely independent third party arm's length ownership, that never would have happened. 
Well, number one, that's not necessarily true because there could have been permission, but it's closed off now. And we're committed to using 886 independently. I don't think there is any merger. I appreciate the merger doctrine, but in this context, I don't believe that's that's what happened here, particularly since again, that is shut off now if you go out to that site. There's no access, there's a fence there, it's, it's boarded up. And at the end of the day, the, there isn't impervious surface that was put out there. It hasn't, there has been some grading and that was a mistake, legally a mistake. But in light of the commitments we're making, I believe that the solution your building inspector agreed to, again, with the village manager and the attorney present, um, is the appropriate one. And legally, I think it's the one that is, is most supportable. And I'm not giving you legal advice. Obviously, it's your own attorney. Uh, OK, Mr. Wexstein. Um... My understanding from what you just said is that you're coming back, uh, you're coming to the planning board at some point in time with a site plan for 888, but not a revised site plan for 886. Is that correct? That is correct. We're complying with the site plan for 886 as we go ahead. That's that's if we have the permit to go ahead, we are we are bound by it. Right. So. so the construction entrance that was created and is now fenced off from 888 to 886 had no uh, impact at all on areas of 886 that were not included in the area of disturbance. Is that what you're telling us? How do, how do we know that? I, I don't have the expertise to tell you that. I think Frank would be in a better position, our engineers not on, but is my, it is my understanding and again, 886, the work did stop, as you noted, and was stopped. So it's in the middle of being done. But my understanding is we will comply with that site plan, or otherwise we do have to come back to you on 886. We are coming back to you one way or another. One way or another on 888, we will be before you, probably not at the next meeting. You know, I don't think that we can meet the April deadline, but I think we would shoot for the following one. So, so. Uh, Mr. Mr. Wexstein, on 886, the change that you made was you crossed into the site at a new location um, and that you've since blocked off. But I guess I don't see how you would get a truck from 888 onto 886 without, without impacting an area that was previously not supposed to be impacted in the pool construction and the pool house construction. John, do you recall the, the uh, stormwater plan that you reviewed in the area of disturbance that was approved? Uh, yes, well, I mean, you know. No, I'm just asking if, if you- I, mean, I, can, I can bring up the, the plans uh, on- That would be helpful. Um, hold on a second, let me see. Uh, I just, uh, hold on. I think the storm order was going to be added to the original 886 house storm order. It was going to be. That's, that's correct. And the construction access was from the driveway at 886. Right. Across the rear yard. Right. So what we're trying to get at is, was there an area of the lot 886 differently disturbed than was allowed under the original site plan? That's that's kind of the question. Yeah, I'm just not aware of the disturbance that has taken place on 888 into 886 because I haven't been to the site. Uh, fair enough. <laughs> but your your site plan doesn't necessarily govern grading at any particular moment. The, the point is it has to be graded to meet the topo that you've approved and the improvements have to be where they're supposed to be. So long as the sediment and erosion control measures are in, in, in place while the work is being done, even if there were some minor change in the grade over there, it has to be put back as, as part of what we're doing, as part of the work. I, I guess what I'm saying is it depends on the limits of disturbance and whether they were expanded 
outside the area that was approved by the site plan. Can you all see my screen? Yes. 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 This is the latest site plan that, that I have. Here's Oriente Avenue. Let me, let me enlarge it. Thanks. And hopefully we'll be able to read it. Uh, okay. So here's 888 down here. Here's 886. Here's the back of 888 where the pool was going to go. Uh, the topo lines sort of go in here a little bit to that. Uh, and uh, here's a stone masonry wall here. If I remember correctly, uh, the old entrance to the property when the other people, when it was a single lot, it was more towards this end here somewhere. So the driveway must be around here. So the entrance to the site was had to be coming in along here, which is not uh, obviously anywhere near where uh, we had approved it. <coughs> uh, um, you know, if I had my druthers, I'd druther, we'd do a, you know, uh, a review of the, of the SWIFT and the site plan uh, for 886 eight, again. But, um, uh, you know, follow the code, there had to be some impact on this area here. Let me see if I can, I'm not, you know, these aren't my drawings. Let me see if I, I have some drainage drawings, but that's not going to be helpful. Um, let's see what is further down on this particular uh, set of plans. I'm kind of having trouble seeing it. I don't know if it's yeah, it's blurry. Yeah, it's blurry. I mean, you, you just you know, this is a site plan. Here's the here's where the pool was. So it, yeah, here's the pool here. This is where the pool yeah. I'm not seeing exactly where you're pointing to on the screen. I don't know if anybody else is. Kathy, do you want me to share screen. my screen? I found the plan as well. You have who's that? Ashley. Yeah. Why don't you do that? Okay, so this is the site plan. Um, the original approval had the construction driveway coming in here. The limits of disturbance are outlined by this hatch line. So there probably was a small, um, you know, in this area here where the driveway probably came in from 888, it probably did cross a little bit into an area that wasn't previously part of the limits of disturbance. Um, but as you could see, the limits of disturbance almost went to the property line, so it wouldn't have been that much. Depending on where the driveway is. Yeah, depending on where the driveway came in. Um, the driveway is more down uh, at the bottom of the site, then it's a much larger. Um, Let me just see if I can see if there's something I can scale it with. Uh, this is 25 feet, so it would be, it's probably like, if it came in here, it's probably like 10 feet. Well, uh, our, our main concern is here, you know, do, do we need a revised site plan for 886? Um, the uh, applicant was not proposing to do that. They were just proposing to come in with one for 888. Um, and are they linked? Um, which they appear to be because uh, the area disturbance is goes from 888 into 886. And uh, should that be done before they get the permit uh, for uh, the pool construction? Um, but again, uh, Frank, you can give a permit without us stopping you. That, that's totally up to you. Um, but I, 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 you know, I don't wanna speak for the entire board. Um, I don't know, um, Jay, uh, Seamus or, or Ellen, if you have anything to add or, or let us know how you feel about this, um, my, my preference would be uh, you know, with Richard and Cindy is to look at the look at, look at the site plan again before the, they were allowed to build the pool. I mean, they're here because they did this themselves. You know, this isn't our fault. This is that they they didn't follow the site plan. So. Uh, this is what the code says, and, and the code says it for a reason. 
but this is my just my opinion. Yeah, I mean that's my preference as well because we we can't we can't we don't really know until we review it again what's been done. So what the impact is of what's what been the impact is. So I feel we would need to review it again. Yeah, <clears throat> I wasn't familiar with the original application, but um, I'm very sensitive to Phil in, you know, anywhere in Mamaroneck, probably particularly floodplains or down in Orienta. Um, and uh, maybe there's legal analysis that I'm not completely clear on, but it's, it seems like you have to follow the site plan because if there's, there's no, there's no, I see no reason for an exception. Right. So if you if you guys would like to make a formal recommendation to Frank, and it is, I stress, just a recommendation, you know, I would say, you know, somebody make a motion and then you can take a vote on it. Okay. Okay. Um, so I need a motion to make a recommendation. And again, it's just a recommendation. Frank, you're responsible for permit issuance. So this is just the recommendation of the planning board. And I understand you had a meeting with the village attorney and the village manager and the applicant yesterday. Um, we understand that, but as everyone knows, the land use boards are independent of the village management and the process. Um, and uh, we, we go by our, the code and by the laws that govern planning boards. So um, I need a motion then to recommend to the building inspector um, that the permit for the pool not be issued until the uh, a site plan review of 886 and 888 either coordinated uh, in one review or two submissions that are reviewed together um, be completed or at least started so we can get a sense of what we're dealing with here. So moved. Would it make a difference? Just would it make a difference to the board if they were to submit promptly a site plan for both pieces of combined site plan? As to your opinion of getting a pool permit, would it make a difference if they submitted a combined site plan for both sites, even though it's separate owners? I think we need some some sort of combination uh, to see because it is they're they're. they're uh, to get it's together whatever was done was done to both properties and it impacts both properties uh, from a legal standpoint and Teresa maybe you can answer this question do they have to be two separate site plans could it be two separate site plans that are are merged because of the legal uh, ownership of the no, I, properties honestly it sounds like their intention now is not to use the two properties together that that if that was a temporary thing based on their contractor not paying attention to their site plan. So um, and of course it's the property owner's responsibility to control their contractor. So uh, so I don't think it matters to the planning board whether they do a site plan for 888 or a site plan for 886 separately or together. I would leave that up to the applicant, but I do think you need to see what was changed on 886 so that you can know uh, that there's no stormwater or other implications related to that. Um, on 888, you know, we just know nothing about what's been left there, so it's hard to draw any conclusion about it currently. I, I think it's a good, I think it's a good suggestion to put both of them on there to put them to bed uh, to show the AA6 for the most part you're uh, um, complying with the AA6 site plan as you've said but I would show both of them and this way there's no question and the planning board has all the information they need to make a decision. Okay. Yeah. See, again, I think that if we have an engineer go out there and explain what's out there and what's going to be done, we, we frankly don't need site plan approval for 886. If we would expedite the process of getting the pool permit, then, then I understand. But it's an observable condition out in the field. 
Okay. The, the planning board doesn't make determinations about site plans in the field. They make them in planning board meetings in public. And that's just a transparency that's required by the open meetings law. So, you know, I, I think what the planning board is, the, I think there's a motion on the table by Kathy and- uh, I think by Cindy. Oh, by Cindy, I'm so sorry, Cindy. Yeah. If, <laughs> so you're looking for a, a Second. Site plan submission for both properties, either separately or together. Okay. That we can at least gauge by the with the contractor's action had any impact on 886. Once we see the paperwork, if there was no impact on 886, we can then say we don't need to do any revised site plan. But we don't know where the trucks went and how they entered the property until somebody is able to put it on paper and show us. Okay. I think you need a second. Okay, and there's the second. Okay. Hey, so, do, you, do you mind? Do you mind restating the um, the motion? Okay. Let's see if I can do. Because I think because I think it's probably I just make a recommendation to the building inspector that he not issue the pool construction permit until the applicant submits to the planning board site plan. Uh, applications for both 886 and 888 Orient Avenue, either separately or together. Okay, now, uh, once we get the submission, the planning board can determine whether or not we need to do a, a site plan review of 886. If, if there was no change to the area of disturbance and no impact on stormwater, and we can make that determination, and then the pool permit can be uh, can be issued while we continue our review with 888. Does that sound like a good plan? I see Ted shaking. I okay. So once we start the site plan review of 888, we will just complete it simultaneously. If assuming nothing has to happen to 886, but I, I don't know that for sure. I don't know where the driveway came in. I don't know where the area of disturbance was, and that needs to be indicated on the new site, um, the revised site plan, that this area was disturbed. It's no longer being disturbed, but it was disturbed. And then the 888, we need to know where the fill went, why the fill went, we don't need to know why the fill went, where the fill went, you know, and what's the condition of the property before and after. We have to, the site plan has to be back from the previous condition before the, uh, the disturbance was done and the fill was added. Okay. All right. Does that okay? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, in the form of a recommendation, uh, uh, it makes sense to me. I was I was kind of thinking that it's more recommendation that the pool permit's not issued until eight eighty six is reviewed. Eight eighty eight is maybe up to the. Uh, right. But but as a as a recommendation, unless anyone has any thoughts about that, I'm just trying to make it kind of, you know, very tied and concise. But I'm I'm. I'm good. So it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Are we good? Everybody, everybody understands it well enough in order to vote. And Teresa, you're comfortable with it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, let's take the vote then. Richard? Yes. Cindy? Yes. Ellen? Yes. Seamus? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Now, Frank, this is just a recommendation. If you uh, so choose, you, you can go forward with uh, the plan that was discussed yesterday with the village and the applicants, um, uh, and or you can wait and do this. But uh, you know, we can, we can't tell you what to do. In other words, we all have our lanes and we stay in them. <laughs> okay. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right, I need a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. Kathy, so, I did want to let you know there was a little edit. I don't know if it matters. I already emailed the applicants, but the next meeting is the 13th of April. So the, two dates would be the 30th. It wasn't the 6th. It's the 13th. Okay. I emailed everybody. But.
Okay. It's my bad. I had that on some stuff. Oh, <laughs> it, could be the, it could not be the second, uh, the, the, but I got the six off. Win, no. the six off of a paper. That I just didn't want to make everyone nervous. <laughs> so I just went with that, but it couldn't possibly be the second one. I went with it too. So. I mean, the, the eighth could be the second one. So <laughs> that's the only mistake. You know what? I, I looked at the conference call on my calendar. Uh, I know. I I just went two weeks back, and I assumed, okay. but I, I just well, had double check. Thank you for clarifying that. that that's, uh, that's getting close to Easter. I think that's the way yeah. for Easter. Getting close to my sister's birthday. That's how I know that. Okay. All right. I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Let's do a, a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. yes. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Very good meeting. Good night, everybody.